All right, hey, so for the first time on the show, George Stoya from Sooner Scoop. I was uh, messing with you, George. I, we, we've had Eddie on the show. We've had Josh on the show. So we've got to complete the Sooner a Scoop trio over here. Th thank you so much for joining the show. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, hopefully I live up to the billing. Uh, I know Josh <laughs> and Eddie, they're uh, they're great guests, especially, you know, Eddie's such a character uh, online, as everybody knows. So hopefully I, I can uh, provide some some insight. Yeah, no, no, I'm sure. But uh, we, we love your content over there. I cannot recommend it enough for that's how I've kind of familiarized myself with Oklahoma over, over the last year or so. You guys do a hell of a job and you got a way more professional setup than, I, than I'll ever have. So ca I can't recommend the content enough. But I wanted to ask you, I, I know it's been a while, so it, it may be hard to kind of remember this exactly, but when the news broke that Oklahoma was coming to the SEC, from from an outside perspective looking in, it, it seemed like a lot of maybe the fans were, were not overly thrilled. Is that an accurate assessment? And and I assume that's changed because it, it seems like the Sooners are, are so fired up to join the SEC now. See, I think it was it's kind of the opposite. I think fans were generally excited, at least most fans. And then I think about a week set in, they're like, wait a second, this is going to be really difficult to compete <laughs> in this conference. I think it was one of those things that people were kind of tired of the Big 12. And I think they look at it in a perspective of, you know, when TCU comes to town or Iowa State comes to town or Kansas, it's just not as fun to get up for. And they're playing all these 11 a.m. kickoffs. And I think there's a lot of fans that thought they were getting screwed over by the TV deals and, and all that kind of stuff. And they're like, oh, this is awesome. We're going to get to go play the best of the best. You know, I, I think OU fans are very prideful in their school. Uh, they believe that it's a blue blood uh, when, you, when you're talking about college football. And so I think people were really excited. And then as time progressed, I think more fans were like, oh, wait, are we are we ready for this type of a move? And I think they're I think now now that it's set in the last couple of years, I think that excitement is, is ramping back up, especially now that you see the schedule, you see who they're going to get to play and who's coming to town. I mean, when Alabama comes to town, how can you not be jacked about that? You know, Tennessee with Josh Heupel, the storylines there, you know, chances to go play at Ole Miss. I mean, it, it's crazy. We've already started looking at. Uh, you know, booking places to stay next year for these trips. And they're already booked up because OU fans have already <laughs> taken all the hotel rooms, the Airbnbs, all that stuff. And so I think OU fans are pretty excited now. But I, I think they were excited when it first happened, mostly because they just wanted to get out of the Big 12. And they also know that to be invited to play in the SEC means something. It means that your program is worth playing in there. And I think that that's the way it's viewed across the board is, it's it's an invitation, right? Like it's not like they just pick anybody to come play in the SEC. Uh, and I don't know how exactly it went down. If yeah, I think OU and Texas probably reached out to the SEC, but the SEC obviously welcomed them in uh, to to the conference. But I think that there's a lot of pride there for OU fans. And and while they're, I think there's a little bit uh, of being scared. I think generally most people are excited. Oh yeah, it's going to be one hell of a time. I pr I promise you, this could be a, unlike any college football season ever, and, and we're just embarking on this journey. So I can't wait for it. Uh, one thing I really wanted to ask you about uh, Dylan Gabriel and, and Jackson Arnold, and and what went on behind the scenes there, because obviously Dylan Gabriel, fantastic season, goes off to Oregon. Looks like he's going to be their starting quarterback, and we all know how involved Oregon is in NIL. I I have no knowledge. I. I Surely you you have a better handle on this than I do. I, I assume Jackson Arnold's he's probably making a, a good about a, uh, amount of money. Five star quarterback. You know the I've heard uh, we we had Josh on the show. He was just singing the praises of this kid. So the high expectations. But are we living in a world now where even Oklahoma, mighty Oklahoma, can't really afford to have two high profile quarterbacks? due to, to money. Did that factor in at all, do you think? I think what Oklahoma did is they're betting on Jackson Arnold eventually being a better quarterback than Dylan Gabriel. Because right now, Dylan Gabriel is a better quarterback than Jackson Arnold because of his experience. The way he played this last year, I mean, if they don't lose to OSU or Kansas, there's a good chance he's sitting in New York for the Heisman Trophy ceremony. And I'm not saying he'd win the, win the award, but 
he had the statistics to be in that conversation this year and the way that he played against Texas. Obviously, everybody remembers that drive and all of that. So I, I think, though, that OU looks at Jackson Arnold and says, man, he's got more talent. Uh, he's a guy that is younger. He's got more years left of eligibility. Obviously, he can play three more years uh, if he chooses to, or at least two, right? And so I think that they said, hey, we'll take the the younger guy with more talent, um, pay him a lot of money because they are an NIL, and not that they weren't paying Dylan Gabriel. I mean, they paid Dylan Gabriel a good chunk of money uh, to be at Oklahoma and obviously be be here the last two years, but I don't think money necessarily played as much of a factor in this as much as OU saying, hey, we need to start thinking about the future. Jackson Arnold, we think, is a Heisman caliber quarterback, a first round talent, whereas Dylan Gabriel, as good as he was this last year, the reality for him is his he probably hit his ceiling. And, and that's not to say he can't go have a great year for Oregon. I think he could compete for a national title at Oregon. That's how good he is. But I think Oklahoma says, hey, we'll take the lumps with Jackson Arnold in 2024, and maybe that's going eight and four, nine and three, turns the ball over a little bit too much. And when we saw what happened in the Alamo Bowl, but they're looking at 2025 and saying, man, think about that experience under Jackson Arnold's belt, how much talent he has and the talent they're bringing in around him. I think there's just a lot of faith that he's going to end up being the quarterback of the future. Whereas if you bring Dylan Gabriel back, right, uh, this next year, there's a very good chance Jackson Arnold hits the, the transfer portal, and then all of a sudden you don't have a quarterback for 2025 or 2026, uh, or it's you know a true freshman year in the same scenario again. So I think oh, you said hey, we've got to take the next step. I think Dylan Gabriel, you know, we spoke to Dylan Gabriel on our our podcast, and he basically said the same thing. He said hey, I understood this was always the scenario, and, and Dylan wanted to go pro after this year. He just didn't get a great draft grade, which he was surprised by. Didn't get invited to the Senior Bowl, which I, I think we were all surprised by. Uh, and so it just kind of worked out this way where. Dylan kind of handed the torch off to to Jackson Arnold, whether he liked it or not. Right. And again, I mean, it, it seems like the expectation is for Jackson Arnold to be an elite quarterback. I know even at, at Sooner Scoop, you, you projected his stats for next season, 3,600 passing yards, 34 touchdowns, and then a couple of uh, more rushing touchdowns. Now those are, that's high expectations, but that is kind of uh, par for the course at Oklahoma here the last uh, eight eight or so seasons for their quarterback. So, I mean, is it wild to expect Jackson Arnold to be a top five quarterback in the SEC, if not immediately, you know, within his, his first two seasons? I, I don't think it's wild at all. And, and that's not to say that there's not great quarterback play in the SEC. I, I think there, there really is when you talk about some of the guys across the country. I mean, I, I think really highly of Jalen Milrow. I, I think he kind of got a bad rap towards the end of the year, but I, I think he's a, a superb talent. You, you talk about Quinn Ewers, who we saw at Texas, but I, I think Jackson Arnold has the talent to be as good, if not better than those guys. Now he has to go out and do it, right? He has to go out and prove it. Uh, we have to see it on a consistent basis. He has to cut back on the turnovers. I think his his relationship with Seth Luttrell, the new offensive coordinator, is going to be very key. I mean, they lose Jeff Lebby, uh, who obviously had a very efficient offense this last year, but there's a lot of faith that Seth Luttrell can be that that same offensive coordinator in the sense of throwing the ball down the field, being able to run maybe a little bit better than what Jeff Levy did. I mean, they kind of run, you know, different offenses, Seth Luttrell, air raid, Jeff Levy spread offense, but kind of mixing those two together is, is I think the plan. And that's kind of why Jackson Arnold wanted, wanted to stick around, but I think he has the, the arm ability. He can run the football. I think he's a really smart kid. I think he has all the intangibles that you want in a quarterback. Now, what does that look like going up against the Alabamas of the world uh, every single week? I don't know. And, and honestly, the biggest concern right now is can they protect him? I think everybody has faith that Jackson Arnold can deliver the ball down the field. We've seen him do it, um, you know, whether it was against BYU when he had to come in, when Dylan Gabriel got hurt, or even in the Alamo Bowl. I know he threw, you know, four interceptions or whatever it was, but he, he still had a very sharp ability to throw the ball down the field in key spots. I'm more worried, can they protect him? Because they lose a bunch of guys on the offensive line, whether it was to the transfer portal or the NFL draft. They haven't done as well in the transfer portal as they had hoped uh, to bring in some guys to help with that. And they have some young freshmen that they really think can be great players, but they haven't played. And, and as as everybody knows, on the offensive line, that experience and, and getting that strength, that game strength, uh, you can be in the weight room all you want, but you, you it's it's different playing on the field and going up against some of these defensive lines they're going to go up against. That's the part that's concerning to me. So I think that there's going to be some 
ebbs and flows, some ups and downs next year for Jackson Arnold. And sometimes it won't necessarily be his fault. I think he might be facing a lot of pressure next year. I just don't know how well they're going to be able to protect him and also run the football. I think being able to run the football can really help this team and obviously help a young quarterback when you can lean on the run game. I just don't know. That's kind of the big question mark for Oklahoma right now is what is that offensive line going to look like next year? Yeah, and you hit on something there interesting with the, with the portal. And I'm, I'm seeing it from Oklahoma fans that, um, you know, maybe maybe the NIL game is, is not where they thought it would be. But, uh, you know, it's not, I, I don't know how fair. I mean, I, I don't know that, that any, if it's fair for any fans, George, but, I mean, we all do it in the SEC. We didn't get this guy. You know, we're not paying enough, all this. It, is how, how all in, so to speak, is, is Brent Venables on, on NIL? Because he's going to have that connotation just working for Dabo that – he hates NIL and he, and he hates this and he hates that. And whether people have any any clue on whether that's reality or not, I don't know. But uh, uh, notable players like uh, like Green that jumped to Missouri, I know I wanted to ask you about him as well. But is is Oklahoma all in on NIL or, or are they kind of uh, kind of middle middle of the road, so to speak, on, on paying some players? I'd say they're more in now than they were say a year ago. I, I think when Brent first took over a couple years ago. It was something that he didn't really, I wouldn't say he didn't not pay attention to it, but it wasn't something that was, you know, top priority. I would say now it, it is a top priority inside the program. And and I, I can tell you that there's a lot of OU fans out there that think, oh, well, they don't have the money. That's not true. OU has the money. Um, they have top donors like a Tim Heddington that's donating a lot of money uh, and, and endorsing NIL and, and putting a lot of money out there. They've been able to raise, you know, a lot of money to, to the point that I think that uh, they're probably top 10 in terms of uh, money in, in in NIL. But the way that they do it is different than a lot of other schools. You know, I, I think one thing that's been important for Brent is he wants to pay every player on the roster. Now, I'm not saying every player on the roster makes the same amount of money, but everybody gets paid. And so that all of a sudden, you know, limits your, your money pool, right? Whereas maybe an Ole Miss or a Missouri or some of these other schools say, hey, we're just going to pay our top 30, 40, 50 players and we're going to pay them more money then maybe they would get somewhere else. And so OU is spending their money in different places. I do think OU's NIL can improve. I think they can do a better job promoting it. I mean, you see places like Alabama where you can get on, you know, Yay Alabama and there's a website and and they have, you know, Nick Saban and, and Greg Byrne and all these coaches saying, hey, support this collective. And I'm sure, you know, I think they're at Missouri, they have a, a video that plays during football games that say, hey, Use this QR code, donate to uh, you know their collective. OU doesn't do that right now. They haven't been promoting it from the university, and I think they're starting to shift that mentality this offseason where they're like, hey, we need to do better on crowdfunding. You know, Right now, they're trying to do $2 million fundraising. Uh, that would be huge because, again, if you were able to get that extra $2 million, that can maybe go to your lower-level players, and then you can spend more money on the bigger-named guys. But I think Oklahoma is also a program. I mean, Burt Venables has said from the start, this is going to be a relationship uh, program, not a transactional program. So they're going after guys that maybe that that want NIL, but it's not their top priority, if that makes sense. They're trying to build a culture and relationships, and that's great. And I think that everybody would applaud that and be like, that's the way to do it. But in today's world, when you see Ole Miss and what they're doing and building through the portal, I think OU fans are like, man, why aren't we doing that? Why aren't we just paying the million dollars it takes to get whoever, right? Or, or what Tennessee did to get a, a Lance Hurd who OU wanted uh, from LSU. I, I think that that's where it gets complicated. And that's why I think this season is going to be really interesting because you have multiple programs like an old Miss or Missouri that's spending all this NIL money to basically build their team through the transfer portal. And if they go and they go 11 and one next year, they're competing, competing for the SEC. They make the college football playoff, the 12 team playoff. Then I think you could see a lot of programs, maybe even in Oklahoma, shift their focus from, oh, we need to pay everybody to, wait a second, maybe we should be spending more money on some of these top guys and bring them in for a one-year rental and make a run. Because right now, Oklahoma's thinking long-term, not short-term, uh, in terms of how they're using the portal and how they're using NIL. And, and things like uh, what happened with, there with Caden Green, does that is that what changes the situation at Oklahoma? And can you rehash just, just what you guys know, what happened there for anybody that that uh, don't know that doesn't know he he was at Oklahoma he transferred to Missouri and it seemingly happened <laughs> overnight and, and nobody knew at Oklahoma this was happening till till it was done 
Yeah, the Caden Green situation's a weird one because I still don't think everyone really knows what all went down behind closed doors. And and from what I understand, NIL was a part of it, but it and, and maybe it was the spark that started that started the whole him wanting to leave. But I think there was a lot of other stuff behind the scenes where he maybe just didn't mesh with Britt Venables. Uh, you know, I think that there was maybe some conversations after the season where you know Caden wanted a certain amount of money. Oh, you was going to give him that certain amount of money. You know, Brent Venable said, hey, maybe uh, you, you're not worth that amount of money. Maybe you, you, we think you can do better. Uh, you can play better and you, then you'll be worth that amount of money. That those sort of conversations. And and I think it just ended up rubbing Caden Green the wrong way to where he's like, I'm going in the portal. Obviously, he's from Kansas City. I think that Missouri was the obvious choice. And I think Missouri ended up paying him, from what we understand, a lot more money than what Oklahoma was going to pay him. So then it all, all of a sudden comes back to NIL. But I, I think there was more to it than just Caden Green wanted more money from Oklahoma and Oklahoma wasn't going to pay him. Oklahoma was going to pay him a good amount of money and really what he wanted. But uh, I think that it came back to, you know, Caden, it just didn't um, always mesh with maybe the coaching staff and uh, it just didn't work out the way. And, and it was a huge loss for OU. And, uh, you know, he's a guy that, Everybody thought he was going to be their best offensive lineman going into the next sheet next season. He played left guard, you know, started left guard, I think six games for them last year as a true freshman. There's some talk of him moving to left tackle, uh, which is what he was recruited to be. You know, I we'll see where he ends up playing at Missouri. I think that was another conversation that maybe he wanted to move back to tackle, didn't want to play guard. We'll see what he ends up doing for the Tigers. But um, I, I just think that the relationship there wasn't as strong as maybe we all thought. And uh, it just ended up being one of those things that Oklahoma, you know, ha has done pretty good in the portal, but they've also lost some really key guys and none bigger than him. Is it safe to assume, George, that uh, Oklahoma will be pretty active in the in the second portal window after spring? Do you think that's safe to say? Definitely. And, and I think that they did really good in certain spots. I mean, they went out and they got a, a Deion Burks, who was maybe the top receiver um, you know, in the portal from Purdue. I, I don't think they need to do anything there. They went out and got a couple tight ends, which was probably their worst position group a year ago. Uh, they went out and got Caden Wooler, the defensive end from Miami, Ohio. That was really productive that they think can come in and can play. They got some pieces in the secondary. It's just that offensive line. They weren't able to get as many bodies as they hoped. And they got three, right? They went out and they got three offensive linemen in the portal. Uh, not the most highly touted guys, but they went and got three bodies that I think that, at least Spencer Brown for Michigan State, the right tackle. I, I bet he starts next year. Uh, Fabichi Nwewu, uh from North Texas. I bet he starts at a guard spot. Guard spot, And then Michael Tarkin from USC also played at Florida. Kind of a swing tackle, swing guard. He can kind of play multiple positions. But they still need to go out and probably get at least two more guys. I mean, right now they only have 12 scholarship offensive linemen on the roster. I mean, they want to get that number up to probably 15 or 16 by the season. And that's still probably on the low end. So I, you know, they're, they're still in it for the hatchet brothers. The two, the two guys from Washington, well, I guess Landon hatchet just announced he's staying at Washington, but his older brother, Garen uh, hatchet started at right guard for Washington. He's somebody they're, tr they're trying to get right now. Uh, but I think in the spring portal, they'll definitely be busy. And, and one interesting note that I'll throw out there, uh, you know, the, the sec rule is that you have to, if you're going to transfer within conference, you have to do that by February 1st, I believe. Uh, and so you cannot transfer within conference during the spring portal. That rule does apply to OU in Texas. I talked to the to uh, SEC officials about that. Despite them not officially joining the SEC till July 1st, they do they cannot take, you know, if say somebody from LSU wants to transfer to Oklahoma during the spring portal window, that player would have to sit out next year. So I think their eyes will be elsewhere in other conferences and not within the SEC. But I do think they'll be active in terms of, I don't think they're going to add like 10 guys in the spring portal, but I do think you could see them take two, three, four offensive linemen in the spring portal for sure. Do you think we've got uh, a little bit of a budding rivalry here with uh, Oklahoma and Missouri? Because I'm seeing these fans Definitely. go back and forth with with Caden Green, Williams and Awari, Luther Burden. There, there's history there. And uh, hey, this is a different Mizzou. We we had at, at last media days, George, we, we spoke to about, 50 people, and about half of them said, well, Missouri, that's not a rival. You know, we we, we, sh we should beat Missouri every year. we just not been beating them. And I picked up a little bit of that from Josh. Not not that he went that far, but he basically just said, when we were playing every year, they were down here, we were up here. Now now they're a lot closer together. It, how, how high on the list of uh, games that Oklahoma's playing next year does Missouri rank as one that the fans are, are interested in? 
I think it's up there just because of all the names you mentioned. You, you've got Caden Green over there. Luther Burden's going back a few years, but he's somebody that Oklahoma desperately wanted. And you, you look up and all of a sudden, he's one of the best wide receivers in college football. I know your friends are like, man, we could have used that guy, right? <laughs> uh, you got Williams and Winery and that whole situation where Oklahoma thought he was going to get him, thought they were going to get him. And then all of a sudden, he flips a couple of days before. So I think that right now, Missouri's had the upper hand when it comes to recruiting and the portal and all of that. Uh, they've had the upper hand, but I, I don't know in terms of a rivalry, it's there yet, but I think it can. And I think that when you look at the opponents in the SEC that OU is going to go up against, I think it's ob I mean, obviously Texas is going to still be there. I think that Missouri is going to be one. I think Tennessee with Josh Heupel, there's some bad blood there. I think a lot of fans appreciate Josh Heupel because he won them a national championship and all that. But in terms of Josh Heupel still uh, loving the program, I don't know if that love is still there despite what he said at SEC media days last summer. Uh, you know, the other one, I think Arkansas would be a great rival because it's right down the road. And I think there's a lot of uh, Arkansas fans that are from Oklahoma. I know, especially, you know, somebody from Tulsa, there's a ton of uh, Arkansas alum in Tulsa. So I think there could be something there, but I think right now, especially if you go on X or Twitter or whatever, Missouri fans and Oklahoma fans are going at it nonstop about every single recruit. <laughs> and so I think that it could definitely build into something. And you even think back, you know, back to the days of Chase Daniel and, and all those guys, you know, Gary Pinkle. Oh, uh, you always had the upper hand, but those were great games. And there was even some games that Missouri would steal one from Oklahoma. So I, I think there's some respect there for their program and especially what they were able to do this last year. I think there was a lot of OU fans that thought Missouri was going to fall flat on their face and, and somehow they were going to be able to flip Williams Winery back or get a Luther Burden to enter the portal and come to Oklahoma, all of those things. And all of a sudden they go, what, a 10 and 2, 11 and 2 this last year and have a great season. They have all this momentum going to next year. So that's going to be a really fun trip. I think that, it, you know, Missouri fans are going to be very fired up for that because I think that they feel kind of disrespected by Oklahoma sometimes. Uh, and so I do think that there is a budding rivalry there, even if I think a lot of OU fans will tell you. That's not true. I, I, those are the same people that are probably living in Missouri fans mentions right now on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Right, you, when a program changes over both coordinators in an off season, that can be a, a real red flag and, and signs that things are not going well. But uh, I don't certainly don't think that's necessarily the case here with Oklahoma because you got Jeff Lebby getting a head coaching job. You can't blame him for that. Seth Luttrell was was already on staff, so there's that continuity play. And then the defensive coordinator, Zach Alley, I realize he wasn't on staff, but he had worked previously with Brent Venables. Uh, which one of those hires do you think was a better hire? And uh, what does it say about Venables that he that he is kind of going with continuity? Does that does that give you even more confidence that that he's he likes the direction of where Oklahoma's going? And and with these hires, you know, he's not trying to blow up either side of the ball. Yeah, I, I like both hires, but I'll start with Zach Alley because I do think that was the better hire just because it's not I'm not saying Ted Roof wasn't doing nothing. You know, he wasn't doing anything for Oklahoma uh, as the defensive coordinator, but he definitely didn't have a huge role in terms of what they were doing defensively. I mean, he was kind of a, a, a yes man in some ways for Brent Venable, somebody he was comfortable with, obviously worked with him at Clemson, very experienced, has been a head coach before, even though he wasn't very successful, has been a defensive coordinator before, but he wasn't calling the defense. I mean, it was Brent's defense. Brent was running the show. Uh, you know, Ted was just there. He wasn't somebody that was out on the recruiting trail a whole lot, wasn't somebody that was evaluating talent and all those things. Zach Alley is going to come in and do those things. I, I don't know if he's going to be calling the defense necessarily, but eventually, I do think he will be. I, I don't think Brent's ready just yet to hand over his baby uh, in terms of calling the defense. But I do think he views him as somebody in a couple years that he can hand the reins to and become more of a CEO head coach, as you've seen some of these other head coaches that have been extremely successful. You know, Kirby Smart, Nick Saban, all these guys, that's what they've done is eventually hand over those duties. And Zach Alley is somebody that is a really good evaluator of talent. He's a really good recruiter. I mean, he he's shown that whether he was at Clemson as just a GA or even at some of the smaller schools, Jacksonville State, Louisiana Monroe, even Boise State, all those places he was he was able to find some of those hidden gems. And now that he's at Oklahoma, he can not only find hidden gems, but he can also go after some of those top-rated linebackers. And Brent Venables trusts him to do that. So I think he's going to bring a lot to the table. Again, I don't know what exactly his role is going to be next year in terms of calling the defense. I don't think they're going to give him those duties just yet, 
but he is somebody that I think will free up Brent Venables to be a little bit more of a head coach, focus on things like game management, uh, you know, helping out with special teams, which was a terrible unit last year for Oklahoma. Zach Alley also has done special teams before, both at Louisiana Monroe, Jacksonville State, and Boise State. He helped with special teams, so I think that they think he can help there. As for Seth Luttrell on the other side, I think it was the easy hire, uh, but I think it was also the smart hire. And there's a lot of people, uh, you know, not necessarily inside the program, but a lot of fans that wanted Jeff Lebby fired after the season. I mean, they looked at those Kansas and Oklahoma State games and they pinned it on Jeff Lebby and the offense. And you look at the metrics, OU was top five in almost every category in terms of efficiency, moving the ball, scoring points. They were really good at that. But if you watched the games, there was a lot of times that they stalled out uh, or that they had a, just a, a head-scratching play call that you're like, why would you call that in that situation? Or they went away from the run or they went away from Dylan Gabriel throwing the ball down the field. And I think that a lot of people said, man, Jeff Lebby, he runs a, an efficient offense. They go really fast, all of that. But OU needs to slow it down. They need to have better situational awareness. Their game awareness wasn't very good. And I think there's a lot of people that think that Seth Luttrell – will have a lot better situational awareness. They're going to slow the football down. I think Brent really wants to slow down the game. You look at, you know, two years ago when Oklahoma went six and seven, they played the most defensive snaps of anybody in college football. And I think that did not make Brent Fittables happy. So they tried to slow down the offense, which was, I think, the third fastest offense in college football in 2022. They slowed that way down this last year. I think they were still top 20 this last year, but I think they really want to, um, you know, put that pace a little bit lower. I think they want to bring their time of possession up, hold on to the football a little bit longer, give their defense a little bit longer breaks. So they're not playing as much. And I think Seth Latrell is going to do that. He's also going to run just a little bit different offense where they can run the ball. At least they hope can run the ball a little bit more efficient in the air raid and kind of those things. I mean, he's a former fullback. So you'd, you'd like to think that he's going to, you know, want to run the football, whereas Jeff Levy didn't always lean on the run. So I, I do like that hire. Do, do I think that they could have gone outside and made an even better hire? Obviously. I mean, there's a lot of people that wanted them to go after, you know, Ryan Grubb at Washington. Um, you know, the, the guy from Kansas, whose name's slipping my mind, who went to Penn state. I think there's a lot of people that thought he would have been a great hire, but in terms of wanting to keep the continuity, like you said, I think it was important because all of a sudden you go out and you get somebody from the outside. They probably want to bring in their own staff, uh, maybe you lose a Jackson Arnold who's really close with Seth Luttrell. He, you know, he worked with the quarterbacks this last year. He sat in those meetings as an offensive analyst, all that stuff. I, I, you were able to keep most of your guys um, in the room. So I think that that's why they ended up sticking with Seth Luttrell. And he, and he has, you know, experience. T to be honest, he's more qualified for the job than Jeff Lebby was when they hired Jeff Lebby. I mean, Jeff Lebby, you know, was under Lane Kiffin at Old Miss. We all know Lane Kiffin's probably was probably calling the plays there. Uh, you know, he was under Josh Heupel at UCF. Josh Heupel was calling the plays there. So this was really Jeff Lebby's first time kind of running the show, whereas Seth Luttrell has done it several different spots. He's been a head coach. He can help with game management, some stuff that Oklahoma has kind of struggled with under Brent Venables. I think it just made all the sense to just have him be the play caller moving forward. Well, we've already talked about uh, the Missouri game. You hit on Tennessee briefly there. Is it, is there a game on the SEC schedule specifically for Oklahoma that you're looking forward to more than any other? And, and let's say putting Texas aside, because I, I realize what that rivalry means to Oklahoma, but is there another one uh, that that is kind of the top on your list? It's got to be LSU, man. Going to Baton Rouge, I'm hoping that's a night game. I've heard it's, it's unbelievable <laughs> down there at Death Valley. Um, and, and, you know, there's some... I don't know if there's bad blood between OU and LSU fans, but you talk to OU fans and they talk about, you know, that 2003 Sugar Bowl when they lost to LSU down in New Orleans. They're like, LSU fans were just the worst. I'll <laughs> never go there again. I hope they never play LSU again. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that because I think it'll be a lot of fun. I think LSU is going to have a good football team next year. It's the last game of the season. And when you talk about OU's schedule next year, I know there's a lot of people out there that's like, well, seven and five, eight and four. I think there's a chance, you know, that they're maybe playing those last couple of games. They play Alabama at home and then they turn around and play LSU on the road. Let's say they win those two games. Maybe they get into the college football playoff. Maybe they get a chance to play in the SEC championship game. I don't think that's going to happen, uh, but you never know. And in, in those last two games, if you can still win against Texas, you beat Missouri, Ole Miss, which I think Missouri and Ole Miss, those are kind of toss up games. We'll see what those two teams look like. Uh, and you got to go on the road to both of them if you're Oklahoma, but 
those last two, I think, will be a lot of fun. And maybe they're heading to Baton Rouge with a chance to sneak in as one of the last teams into the college football playoff. And I think LSU could be in the same boat. Maybe they're playing for something bigger, too, in that last game. So that's the one that I've circled. And even before it was the last game of the season, I was like, man, I can't wait to go down there and see what a game day looks like there because I've heard it's it's quite the spectacle. And I mean, Oxford's going to be awesome going to Old Miss. Uh, I've heard that's quite the scene. That's that's one that we've been looking at trying to book. There's just nothing available to go. <laughs> I think a lot of OU fans have that one circled as the one that they really want to go to. But for me personally, I think LSU is going to be quite the trip. All right, last thing for you, George. Really appreciate your time. But where do we stand on the horns down and why why are Texas people so soft about that? You know, I it's funny. I think that the majority of Texas fans actually agree with OU fans. And maybe that's maybe that's me being naive, but I think Texas fans kind of enjoy it a little bit. But I don't know. I mean, Texas fans, they're they're very um what's the word? They're very prideful. Uh, I think in their university. And I think that they just think it's kind of trashy or tacky to kind of use their hand signal against them. Um, but that's just how Texas is, man. It's the same narrative about Texas is back and uh, we're going to do this every year. They're top five. And and I think that Steve Sarkeesian is great. I think that they're, uh, you know, going to do a really good job. I think he's got that program headed in the right direction. I'm not so sure about Rodney Terry. I, you know, that was a whole debacle about that but look when you beat texas uh i think you gotta you gotta throw the horns down and i hope the sec it's gonna be interesting to see because you know the big 12 took a pretty hard stance on it where they said hey if you throw the horns down it's a 15 yard penalty against your team the last few years i wonder i don't know if that's been asked to greg sankey um you know what they're gonna do about that because i i know now you know the university of oklahoma they've always had kind of a policy that any type of you know, public photos, anything like that. The cheerleading squad, uh, even coaches weren't allowed to publicly throw the horns down and and, and promote it on social media uh, <laughs> because they didn't want to get in some sort of beef with Texas. Now, the last few weeks, I've seen, uh, you know, OU coaches posting photos with recruits doing the horns down. So I, I don't know if that policy has now changed now that they're in the SEC because they don't care anymore. Um, but it, it's going to be fun, man. I, I, I think it's a lot of fun. And look, anytime you can poke the bear, like Texas, I think um, you know OU fans and SEC fans are going to take advantage of that because they they do get pretty upset about it, um, especially the you know the folks with inside the program. I think the guys, I think most Texas fans though outside the program, kind of have some fun with it. I know Sankey's been asked about it. I've I've been there when he's asked about it. I can't think of what he said, but just a heads up. If I don't know how familiar you are with, I'm him. sure he, it's a I'm sure it's like a taunting thing. Like if you're doing it in someone's face, it's probably a no go. But if you're just doing it for fun. But you know. that guy, hey, as great as he is, he, he's the best commissioner in, the, in college football. He is elite at dodging questions and, yeah. and saying a lot but that, that says nothing. So be yeah. prepared for that up here at the upcoming Media Days in Dallas. So, George, can't thank you enough. Before you go, can you tell our audience how can they find you? How can they follow your work and, and find you on social media? Yeah, you can find me on X, Twitter, whatever you call it. Uh, just my name, George Stoya. That's S-T-O-I-A. Um, you know, Soonerscoop.com with on three. That's a good place to check out our work, too. So you can find everything. Most of my stuff is on Twitter. You mean you can follow me on Instagram if you want, um, but I don't do a whole lot of posting on there. Um, but uh, Twitter is usually where I'm at, usually firing off some uh, some dumb tweets. But uh, yeah, that's where you can find me. 